Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And today we're going to look at the Will Eisner sketchbook. This is the uh, Dark Horse published this sometime in the early 2000s, I suppose, and did a hell of a job with it. It's a really nice book. Um, as we go through it, one thing that, that we're not going to get to see on camera is the quality of the paper that this is printed on, but it's a beautiful paper stock. It's kind of a heavyweight, toothy paper, I assume to approximate, you know, the sketchbooks and what he was drawing on because it's all in pencil and it's just, it just feels good. You know, good paper, it just has that quality where it's, this is heavy, heavyweight paper and a well done, nicely produced book. Yeah, the entire presentation feels like a, a old, like, li library book from you know when you were a kid man yeah you know well read well worn down to like just like the texture of the hard covers like they were definitely going th for something yeah it, it has a whole you know i think it's a well produced uh well designed book in that regard it definitely has a quality to it uh through and through so really nice on that end and uh it covers several of his books and each piece you know they're broken down into sections based on the work itself the, mm -hmm. the book itself uh, you know, that the sketches are related to. And then there's some introduction about his reference on what he was doing, tools that he was using, what he changed whenever he went to the finished piece. And we're going to see, you know, this is his writing process really is, is what we're going to see in here. Let's let's uh, shout props to Kerry Grazzini on the designs of this. Not not familiar with, with Kerry's work by name, but this is definitely a feature piece. Yeah, and you know, so the publication date here is 2003, and I mention that because I think comics and book design have really evolved, you know? So, like, this is the early days of, like, starting to work out how do we present a nice art book in the comics world? And, and how do we make this stuff look worthy of a wider audience and, and not that comic book format? And so this was an early, an early stab at it, and I think they do a lot of stuff well. As I already mentioned, the page, uh, the paper quality, but, like, the scale of it is nice. You know, you get a good look at these images, and I wonder what size Eisner was working on. You know, I'm sure they vary from, you know, project to project. But I wonder how close this is to actual size because it does feel kind of right. So these, uh, this first section are various spirit pieces. Some for collection covers, some for prints that were made. And again, this very first piece spells out what some of these pieces are and where they ended up and, and changes that were made from the sketch version to the finished piece. There's things to learn, too. Like, you see that he blocks in rough uh, perspective grids. Like, once you have that, then you could put your figures in space. Yeah, and he's not, uh, you know, I, I think it's safe to say he's not measuring out uh, a uh, vanishing point or anything. These are approximations, but... A guy who totally understands it, obviously. Right, and you know, do it, do it for fifty years, man. You're going to figure some stuff out, and if you don't, you better stick with your day job. Virtuoso drawer. I think that when we think of Will Eisner, we often think of innovator and you know, graphic novel and storytelling in the panels and everything. But really great drawer. Oh, definitely, man. And and uh, we, because this is sketching, like don't, we don't see the finished piece, man. But I still draw a lot of drapery that I learned from him, and what he would call the the train track fold where it would be the open shape with like a cross hatch line or a hatch line in the middle i love that and you see you know the lettering is, is a piece i always respond to and goes back to like all you know early days of him when he's doing spirit and it has the amazing title the title lettering and thing and those splash pages um you know you get to see that is on display in a lot of these too as he's kind of working out the whole composition heck of a serif font man that was for the uh, kitchen sink issues yeah, and you know, you even see the evolution, right, of the of the sketch in a couple of iterations here. Yeah, I have almost every one of those kitchen sink issues and, and you know they're in chronological order. Oh, this is uh this is John Law. <laughs> no joke. Who's so, just a spirit uh repurposed. Right. So uh getting into one of his most famous works, A Contract with God. Uh, 1978, often credited as being, you know, the, the prototype, at least from a marketing standpoint, of the graphic novel format. Yeah, a big comic book with a spine. Yes. And so uh, I brought a couple finished, you know, the finished published pieces so that we can do some comparing and contrasting. And, uh, and we'll start with this one. So you can see the sketch, the rough layout versus the finished piece. And one thing that you'll see in all the examples that we compare and contrast is these are not pen pencils. You know, this is not a blown up image that he then inks for the finished piece. This really is just a concept. It's just that the drawings are so good. Like when I first started looking at this, I was like, oh, he must just be going over those. 
And to some extent, he sort of does. You know, like it, that's where he gets into the technical part of what's the next step in these. And sometimes it's blowing them up or redrawing them or lightboxing them at different sizes even. Uh, but you do see variation from, from the sketches to this. Um, I think it's noteworthy in the lettering because he's such a great letterer. This is the direction he starts, but not ultimately what he what he's happy with and ends with. One of the great serif fonts. Every cartoonist should have a serif hand lettering font of their own. Yeah, I think that is true, and I think many of us do. Yes. So uh, here we have another example. You know, concept, concept, finished piece. And again, you see certain changes that that happen. So as detailed as this appears, this is still just a rough. This is him doing his writing in this stage and he says that in the in the beginning of this chapter and in the beginning of several of these chapters is that he is writing uh you know like this is how he writes um you know he considers this the writing process even though it looks like a very tight drawing um but the way he i guess learned to work words and pictures man all right so we may come back to a few more examples there but the focus is definitely the sketchbook so i'm going to keep going i think those examples illustrate kind of the difference from from this stage to the finished piece but you do see it's all there. Like, this is really uh, story 101. It's so fascinating, too, uh, because the um, Kurtzman Jungle Book is on, like, these pre-rolled pages, too. So it, it makes me think, like, okay, so you're the first one. So did Poor House Press, like, like what is this template that, that you have? Is it, is it for the typesetters or something? That's a really good question, and I'm curious, too, Ed, because I don't know the answer to that. You know, I my takeaway is this is what I do is like I set up a template whenever I start a project. I figure out like size and everything so I can make my own, but I have no idea how this would have been done, you know, back then because this is printed. It's not like you're dashing this off on your inkjet printer. Right. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know who's setting no, all that up. There's no Xerox machine. Like, it's like, you know, expense was made to create those boards. I love this too. It's like freehand lettering, you know. It's the layout, it's the rough, so you're not seeing any ruled lines or anything. It's just like, put it down on the paper. And when he gets more senior in age, like, like I don't know that he really uses the Ames Guide. Yeah, it's there are a handful of cartoonists that I think don't bother with it, and that's been a big influence. I've done several of the Street Angel books from the last series that I was just doing freehand lettering. Um, you know, and, I, and I've talked about some of the letterers that do that. I think Farrell Dalrymple does that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's case by case basis, man. Depends on 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 the art. You yes. know, if you have rigid art, uh, you need you need that rigid lettering. I never made this connection before, but I think Farrell is a fan of Will Eisner, if I remember correctly. So I wonder if some of his idea of like freehanding this reminds me a lot of his lettering. You know, as I'm flipping through here and seeing these compositions, it really feels like certain things I've seen in Farrell's work. So I wonder if that's if this is where it comes from. You know, he worked with Diana Schutz and Dark Horse at times, so this would have been around that era. I'm sure he was looking at this book or aware of it at least. When you pencil, do you pencil like this? Or do you, do you like, hold the thing on the side? Because, like, you could tell he uses that flat end. Yes. Yeah, he talks about that in interviews. I tend to pencil with the point. Yeah. Um, but he has fascinated. talked about, I think it was in the Frank Miller interview, where he talks about how sexy it is, that big, thick stroke you can get out of the, uh, out of the, the wide pencil Yeah, Frank Miller pencil definitely tip. says that. So moving on, uh, like I said, there are several of, of his stories that are covered in here, and you'll see different approaches to each of them. This is fun. You get to see the characters being worked out a little bit. But most of it is comics, which is exciting if you're making comics to see this kind of version of it. And uh, let me pull out a couple. I think I have this page. Rough on the left there, finished printed piece on the right. And again, still making edits, you know, as he goes. Like these, This is a draft. It is not the final piece. And a lot of changes here, you know, as some of these pages end up becoming several pages. Oh, is that true? Mm -hmm. So so some of this is... Yeah, some of it's... Because you can see, like, this sequence, right? Oh, right. This, this little bit of a sequence becomes, like, its own page. Dang. So some massive changes, even though this looks finished, like, I'm ready to pass that to the inker, and it's <laughs> right. like, Will Eisner, this is really, you know, whenever it says sketchbook, like, this is really him working it out like this is a draft that is not the finished piece even though it looks so polished and again this is a guy who has been drawing for at that point 50 years and, and could <laughs> draw anything interesting that he uses non-photo blue underneath like some of these already very sketchy pieces yeah you can see some of it too like he's almost doing a draft of the lettering in that non-photo blue yeah so it's like there's a rough underneath this rough this reminds you know, me of I, a lot of his uh, of his book, you know, sequential uh, yeah. comics and sequential art. 
where he talks about body language, and you see him really striving for that and obviously valuing that in his own work, practicing what he preaches. Yeah, very pantomime -y. Mm hmm It's something I think about a lot. It's the actor, you know? It's it's that role of, like, well... <laughs> or over-actor. Yes, I guess so. <laughs> Comics are exaggeration. Obviously. Another example of that super heavy pencil, the, the, the wide soft there, There's a video of uh, John Byrne like drawing some cyclops that. and shit, and he's he's like you know holding it like a little baby mm -hmm. who holds a fork, and I'm like, that's a real artist right there, man. It's almost pastels. It's such a wide mark that he's making, and he even gets into some of that like like switching up. I used the soft, thicker three B lead in a mechanical pencil for what we're gonna see here. So. You know, he's even switching up at the sketch stage the tools that he's using and the approach that he's bringing to it. Oh, the dreamer. His propaganda piece. <laughs> <laughs> so there's your dreamer splash page, title page uh, comparison. I like this lettering of the cafeteria sign a lot. I suppose the finished piece makes a little bit more sense, uh, you know, for, for that time period, but it's so much fun to see these roughs. And again, they're so rough. You know, like, look at the amount of detail that he actually is putting into that scene, but just enough for him to understand what's happening there and a little bit of indication of light and shadow. Yeah. That's the other thing that you see worked out a lot is those compositions of, like, spotting blacks. Yeah, just balancing the page. Gotta love the dreamer as a cartoonist seeing the uh you know the subject matter it's, it's fun to see the process yeah man that will eisner man he was a swell fella also the open panels we've talked about those that's something it's pretty new to, to the way i think about composing pages his urban settings are just fantastic as well especially like like at this late period it's like you know lifetime new yorker man so he like had those stoops and stuff down yes uh cartoonists often you know learn anatomy from other cartoonists I would learn like city cityscapes from other cartoonists and Will Eisner as as good as it gets for uh, for the city stuff, especially for New York City. Yeah, it seemed like that was just something that man he figured out how to draw that stuff early, and that was just part of his vocabulary. Then there's a good example of the spotting of the blacks working out composition. All that lettering is just gorgeous, you know, for freehand lettering like. It's more legible than some of the lettering I see in finished printed comics. <laughs> <laughs> some of the talk in in the uh, like the interstitial materials too, they have there are timelines involved. So he'll say like, you know, he worked on this book. It took him a year. I'm curious. I, I, that's awesome, man. That, like that's worth the price of admission alone to me. Any of the insights, you know, like this is such a good piece for the process stuff. Uh, sketchbooks vary so much like I guess how artists or publishers approach the sketchbooks that they put together um, but this one is really great for process and insight into process you know from seeing the literal literal drawings to like seeing the whatever behind the scenes notes he includes you know and combine that with some of some of his uh, other interviews and things you can really put together a lot of insight into how he's working and thinking about putting together these books that it's a lot of a lot of graphite on the page man i wonder if somebody saw some of his roughs like this and then pushed him into publishing work that looks a little bit more like this because there's a there's a story he did a vietnam story um after this or maybe concurrently around this time that dark horse put out and it's much more like this than uh, the finished inked pieces that he would do. And, and we're going to see some of those, some of the pages from that project in this book as well. But whenever I look at this and I think like, this is, I could see this as a finished piece. You know, right. it's very clear. It's beautiful drawings. Like, it works. It was just uh, unthinkable at the time. Yeah. And, but like just print technology, scanning technology, like a lot has evolved since we got into the game. Yeah, and Ed, we talk a lot about these these visionary guys who will figure out something and they'll sort of push the medium and expand the landscape of comics, and Will Eisner, obviously, one of those guys, but still being limited in certain ways. Sure. Things they can't get over or, or you know, see beyond, and I think that production is a piece of that. You know, like, this would be... In, 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 no way you would publish something like this as, as a finished piece, uh, you know, from his perspective, I think. Right, yeah. And, you know, like, just speaking to what you said, man, it's like... 
make your contribution. Like, add your piece to the culture and, and you know, live with it. It's such a beautiful drawing, though. You know, it, it finished piece equally good. Hey, it's uh, printed in a book, man. You have it forever, so. It is true, yeah. Ultimately, this does get into, obviously, into book form, but that's nice. That's very nice. Yeah, and, and, and Chris Ware, he didn't have to make like little uh, dioramas. <laughs> I was just thinking Chris Ware whenever I look at this. <laughs> this was a piece, I don't know, I, I think this was never published, but again, like some of the inside information there, it was for Kitchen Sink Press who did a lot of the spirit and the, and the new adventures of the spirit. And, uh, and so you get to see kind of a spirit story, a you know relative recent late era spirit story. Really good ink slinger, man. Incredible. Always great with with the rain effects. Yeah. But also always great with these lines that would create a gray. Like a lot of his compositions, that's something that impresses me. And and there's a great example of it, right? So he's creating this gray just out of those that vertical line that he would also use as a texture for rain. I often talk about these guys that would have like three or four textures and you could apply them in different ways to make up a wide variety of surfaces. And it's like, that's the same rain texture. It's just here it's being applied, one, for gray, if, you know, to create that gray value, but also for that cityscape silhouette. And look at the mood and atmosphere. And and I would sit, if tasked with a situation, like, I'm drawing every window in the buildings back there and stuff. And he's like, no, no nonsense, man. This is also, we talk about his um, coming from like a stage back, you know, thinking right. of like a stage. Theater. And to do that, you know, you might have a couple props. It's like, what makes the scene? And so it's like, oh, a lamp post, you know, a fire hydrant, a garbage can. Very it subtle, is. but it's it's almost a stage setting, except that it, it's exterior. You know, you can do it in a drawing. It, I guess you could do it maybe on, on a stage to some extent, but it really shows like a theater design influence, in my opinion. Jim, this is so good for me to see right now, man, because I'm in the mindset of playing around with page composition. And just like watching him bounce around the page is, is really, really uh, inspiring to me. I enjoy, you know, like seeing character designs is fun. That's obviously a, a thing I think a lot of people appreciate as especially young artists. You know, it's very fun to draw the figures. And, and that's what attracted me to comics in the first place. We're drawing these characters I loved. Neat to see a guy of, of his ilk, uh, you know, approaching the same thing. The, the standalone drawings to me are one of the strong pieces of this book. Like, that's just a great drawing. Right. Same thing. Love them. If this is... If if Dark Horse is holding on to any of these books, is like dead stock. It ain't going to be dead for long. <laughs> yeah, I did not buy this when it came out. If you noticed in the beginning, there's library insignia. I buy so many books you know, used and secondhand, and maybe sometimes when I see them in person, like at a half-price books or somewhere... You know, you can find these books relatively inexpensively. If, if, if you do a nice Eisner book, a lot of them are printed. So right. this is not a, exactly a rare item. So Last Day in Vietnam is the story that I was talking about that looked a little bit different and less polished than a lot of his, uh, a lot of his other comics that I think of. You know, very open layouts and sort of a sketchy, almost like I was drawing it there. Right. You know, like a, like a field reporter yeah. or something. So I think it's deliberate, but I also wonder, like, were people seeing his work at this point and, and thinking about it like, hey, man, check this out, because this is 2000. This is pretty late, you know, late era. People were starting to do this and, and push formats and production and, and really kind of as comics continue to branch out visually and not just be that black outlines, this would have been in that time period. So it's even Will Eisner thinking experimentation and outside the box and new production ideas. Because these are like page layouts from that book. Right. You know, a far cry from the uh, much tighter kind of stuff we're used to with him. I did think of Harvey Kurtzman, Ed. You know, you mentioned Jungle Book. And this format did remind me of that where it's, it'd be like, this would be great. It's like those paperbacks you know like yeah i have a jules pfeiffer paperback like that that little size and it's these remind me so much of like that perfect fit for that that kind of a canvas you know especially like that three vertical pan four vertical panels boy that's a great open panel right i guess it's one you know that's that's your distant foreground as they're approaching those steps almost animation quality with the pagination 
Such a natural flow, too. Easy to read. I think about, like, the the amount of learning that he must have done when he was doing a weekly seven-page comic for years and years and years, man. It really inspires me to try to make work faster, but still maintain high quality. You know, it's, it takes, like, a long, some long nights, but um, you you got to learn a lot. I wonder a lot about him because the readability is so good. You know, what we call storytelling or something, the panel to the panel, the flow, the easy to follow. And I wonder like how much of that is, obviously it's conscious, you know, he's working that out, but I wonder how much of that is something that, that he just understood on the, you know, that was intuitive rather than, I don't know, studied or something, because it seems like that's a big part of his work from the beginning, from those spirit days. Look at this man, a pay stop on his rough. There's a few of those scattered scattered throughout if you you know if you watch several on, on this sequence in particular. But I don't know what he would have been looking at, you know, as like a guide for for that readability, that panel to panel piece. Because early days, I mean, it, it was even early for like, you know, some some of the film practices probably weren't as you know, I think he took a lot of lighting and things from film, but in terms of like that panel to panel i don't know that you would make a one-to-one -one comparison to say film editing or something right. you know it's very compositional on the page heck of a book man it's strong and uh it's it's pretty neat to see this format i always admire his brush ability something that he kept like clear to the end you know that protocols of zion i think was the last finished book that he did and i read that not too long ago and the inking and drawing is so razor sharp. You know, like so many cartoonists, as they get older, it seems like the skills erode. You know, sure. I mean, like you're old, you're, 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 you probably have arthritis. Who knows? You know, your eyesight's not there. And it's like he, he maintained that. It's incredible because it's razor sharp inking and stuff. He still has those vertical lines that I talk about. The feathering is beautiful. Uh, the lettering is on display there. You know, the display lettering. I think it's, I think it's a digital font, a lot of that book. But like the title lettering and stuff, you know, it has his hand on it. And it's as sharp as any of the stuff that I've seen by him. Yeah, like like my my great hope is is lies in the cartoonists who can hold on to a, a lot of that stuff, man. He he does it, you know. Crumb is approaching senior senior age, man. Like his stuff is just getting tighter and more detailed and more clear, yeah. which is divorced when you think of like many other artists, you know, Kim, Kim Deitch, like there, yes. you know, if we could point to a few who are just like maintaining that and getting freaking better and, and continuing throwing uh, those fastballs, as you say, man. Yeah. It's atypical, but it, there, there is a group you can look to for uh, inspiration in that front. So there are a lot of cartoonist sketchbooks. I want to go through, you know, many of them uh, because they do, they are, they do vary a lot right. uh, the way people use these. And I think this is a good one to start with. I think it's amazing and was very excited whenever I actually got my hands on a copy because it does reveal so much about, about a really great cartoonist and how he works. I think the kayfaber is going to dig it too, man. What do you say? You want to get the heck out of here? You guys know what to do. If you haven't done so already, like, subscribe, and follow the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon. We'll let you know when those next videos are available. Make sure you do so because we are on the road to 15,000 subscribers. You can pick up cartoonist kayfabe merchandise and t-shirts at the links below. And be sure to sign up to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter, also at the link below. Jimmy, let's go practice sketching with that like <laughs> that wide part of the pencil tip, man. Give him those marching orders, dude. Read more comics.